there's the stepping program of Zero Power Pack. The first one was this morning. We had a couple of people at home. So I was like, that's the answer And this brought my Federation about television. We want to find a forum for the expression of ideas not well represented, ignored, suppressed, or ignored by the mainstream media. It was like forums for critical discourse. And I'm very thankful that um, Mr. Carrier um, agreed to speak today. It was very interesting it's earlier this morning, and I think you will feel likewise feel he's very interesting. Um, he represents the Fully Informed Jury Association, and they have a lot of good premises, and they do a lot of good stuff, and they want to educate you about a lot of good things. And without further ado, I will hand the floor over to Mr. Whistleblower Courier. Have you ever heard of the Fully Informed Jury Association? Most people have. But we've been in existence for, well, over 10 years. Can't remember for sure when it started. But uh, this is my legal name. For first name, middle name, what? I was uh, baptized. Born in Cook County, Illinois, baptized William Edward Courier. And my name change is kind of interesting, and I'll get into that a little later. Do an explanation of what happened to me and why I'm so strong in this fully informed career association. Uh, well, after I was born in Chicago, Milwaukee as a baby and uh, was raised in the Milwaukee area and graduated from high school and got married within six months after I was graduated from high school and uh, started to raise a family. I have a boy and a girl. The boy is now 41, the girl is 37. Uh, after I was uh, married, but before we had children, I served in the Navy for a short period of time, and I came back and worked at a few odd jobs before I took a full-time position as a police officer for the city of West Dallas, which is so of my office, my fault, and worked there for 23 years before I retired, took an early retirement at age 52 in 1984 for various reasons, which I'll get to. But uh, the job of a policeman is kind of boring because you ride around and it's frustrating with all the get-out because you come to work and they read the daily report which talks about burglaries, house burglaries, and this is the suburb of Milwaukee. Milwaukee is not very big. The crime is not bad in West Dallas and this is Milwaukee. But this crime, and they talk about vandalism and indecent exposures and robberies, and not so many robberies, but burglaries, especially burglaries. And you sit there feeling so helpless to do anything about it because you just ride around all day and you get bored riding around. It did at that time anyway. I started in 1961. And a few interesting things I should mention. Uh, during my whole career, there was not very many uh, interesting and dangerous situations, one of which was we stopped a uh, outlaw gang who had busted up Saturn and just fought two of the fire tent by hitting over his own pile. And uh, we caught him, and that posed some danger when I stopped him in a single one-man squad, which is, well, they just had started one-man squad at the time, and before that, that was a two-man squad. But at any rate, uh, I turned out to go down the squad, and we came soon enough, and we didn't uh, have any problems with the uh, trying to shoot him, and, and they convicted the guy finally. I forgot what it was, but uh, another incident, we caught a robber robbing a grocery store. But that's the only really exciting uh, event I had in criminal activity during my 23 years on the police force. A couple of interesting uh, times I had when I was assigned to picketing at the Custodial Tank where the scabs were trying to get in, and all the workers were there trying to block their way, and it's our job to break away uh, a path of these guys. And uh, I got knocked down in the scuffle, and uh, I couldn't have trampled on but some of the union people helped me back up, so there was a good rapport between uh, police and most people at that time, which was in the early 60s. But uh, as I 
I continued my career. I just happened to, in the 70s to run across some people passing out flyers in the street corners of the neighborhood where I was touring a one-man squad. And I took the flyers and recognized their free speech rights to stand there and hand out flyers for their cause. And unless there was a serious inter, uh, complaint about it, and really had to get in somebody's way, I, I didn't bother them. And we got no complaints, so I didn't bother them. But anyway, this was the LaRouche movement, as they were heard of them. Linda LaRouche ran for president a couple of times. But uh, I studied some of their materials and found out about the Council on Foreign Relations and Trial Out of the Nation. You know, those things. Mainstream media never talked about it. Some of the uh, Patriot publications, most famous of which is Spotlight, you heard of that? The legal publications. They talked about it all the time. And uh, I learned through him about those organizations and about the money system being a uh, fraudulent in nature. I was created in 1913 by the passage of the Federal Reserve Act. We've got fiat money now, so we have no backing whatsoever behind the so-called dollar, which was supposed to be 371 and a quarter grains of silver, 99% pure price of the Constitution. That's what a dollar is, but they just ignore that. But in 1913, excuse me, also the Federal Reserve uh, was passed along with the income tax. So those two hand in hand are fraudulent in nature, and then the Social Security system came about in Roosevelt's term, which uh, put more fraudulent nature behind the question of the income tax. So after studying the chair of the LaRouche and finding out all the corruptness, and at that time, when I was a boy, I got a car when I was 16 or 17, I was on a bus, and at that time, gas was under 20 cents a gallon. And during the late 60s or early 70s, I think it was, is when the price of gas went up double and triple into our price today. But the uh, control of the gasoline and so forth was exposed by the Rouge Group and as sort of fraudulent nature. And I've forgotten about the, the details about it, but it pointed out to me that our government lied to us all the time. And uh, so I was getting... Uh, Concerned about the income tax on that fraudulent federal reserve money system. So I decided to stop filing 1040 forms in 1985 and 1984. Well, I didn't file any more, and then I decided I'd better retire early at 52 because the guy would come after me and fire me if I, if I knew I didn't file an income tax return. So I stopped filing income tax returns. In 1985, and I haven't filed a 1044 since. And of course, I have uh, arguments with the taxing authorities ever since, and I owe huge sums to both of those agencies according to that. But I won't get into that because that's not the purpose why I'm here. But anyway, during the 80s, then, uh, after I retired, I was concerned about the taxing system. I joined a, a group called the Wisconsin Society for Educated Citizens, which was a so-called tax protest group, and they study the Constitution, and how our courts are not upholding the laws and the Constitution is what is wrong. And we challenged at that time various aspects of the law. One of the things was that the doubt the validity of the registration of vehicles forced you to have a registration, and the tax of, of those vehicles, the packing of the registration, the license plate, and the validity of interfering with your right to travel to the travel section. So we were arguing those issues, and one of our people uh, applied for uh, registration for her car and sent the registration fee in minus the sales tax because she said the sales tax on the license, the license is a tax, so the sales tax on the tax is a tax on the tax, precisely what we don't see for in, in the Boston Harbor with that when we uh, became a constitutional republic. And so she, of course, they wouldn't give her a license plate because of uh, the fees not being all there, and they don't want to argue with things. So she was driving around for some time, without license plates on the car, 
And about the time that she got stopped, uh, I'll have to remember her aspect. One of our other Patriot friends had challenged the registration of his vehicle, and he wrote a, they gave him a ticket for him and thought there no registration on his car. So he wrote a motion to dismiss, according to the legal standards and so forth, and took it to the municipal court in New Berlin, which was the suburb he got stopped in, which is Walton the County District. I think during the court hearing on this, uh, the members of the Wisconsin Society of Rights Citizens, which I was uh, one of, attended his hearing, anxious to hear the arguments of the city attorney in opposition to his motion to dismiss. And we never got to that because uh, I was, I just retired from the police force in 1985, and this was occurring. And the lady who had gotten the ticket for no registration had her vehicle impounded because she was driving along so long without place on the car, even though she had the proof that she sent in for the registration place. The police officer stopped her and uh, impounded her car and gave her a ticket for no register, uh, failed to register her vehicle. So she, in turn, started a legal action called Reflet to get her car back. So she filed a reflective action in the same court in Washoe County. And she, that's not a municipal court, but that's, that's a circuit court in Washoe County. But anyway, uh, she, she served the city attorney and the Pony County that pulled her car, and she wanted to serve the police officer. So she mailed the police officer uh, a copy of the summons and complaint, and he recognized her address and name on, on, the, ticket, on the mail that he was to the house. And he rejected it and sent it back to her, her home because he wouldn't accept the mail. So they approached me. They know I just retired the police officer when he served us. He started to involve this thing. Sure, I'll serve it. So he happened to be the bailiff in the municipal court on the evening that the trial was for the other patriot that was challenging the registration. So during the recess, before the case was called, I took the papers up to Sergeant Fowler, and I as he was walking out of the room, I said, Sergeant Fowler, you have some legal process for me to serve, to serve you with. He says, I don't want your papers. So he knew that I was with the group because the Constitution of Society for Educated Citizens, because we had about 20, 25 people in the audience, and they recognized us, and we were troublemakers, we were attached to those So he knew that we were troublemakers, per se, so he didn't want, he recognized what I was there for and probably realized that this was the, I don't know what he said, he was too late, I don't to but he didn't accept the service of And I was kind of flabbergasted. Here, a police officer, nobody ever uh, uh, refused his service from the police officer. So when the court was going to start up again, he's walking back in the room and he had cut how to do it. And I said, well, I just had him on the shoulder with papers. And I beat them, he's considered served. So I just walked back in the room. I said, Sergeant Fowler's, I walked up behind him, and as he turned it, tapped him on the shoulder with the papers, and got him to say, you're served. And he turned around and said, you're under arrest. And I was just fired at that. I didn't want to think. So I walked away from him, and he followed me, and I said, well, I can't run from this. So I stopped, and he, he seized me and put me in handcuffs. And he let me off. And I won't go into the whole details there because there's other aspects of it. But by the time it was through, I was charged with two counts of disorderly conduct and one count of obstructing an officer. And because these police officers were kind of picked at us because of troublemakers, in their minds that uh, if you charge the person criminally rather than municipally, that's a more serious thing. But I thought, well, if I'm charged criminally, I can have a jury trial. So I was kind of thankful of that. But at any rate, he uh, put me in handcuffs and led me away and put me in jail. And because I was reluctant to sign a reconnaissance bond, they wouldn't let me go home. Because I challenged the jurisdiction for them to even hold me because it was a false arrest. So anyway, I stayed in jail for 28 days because I refused to sign a reconnaissance bond. And then I got kind of ill in jail, and because of my illness, I decided not to get out of there. So I signed a reconnaissance bond and went home and checked into the hospital for a short while and got out the next day and so on. But anyway, we have a jury trial for that. And 
uh, I wanted to talk to the jury about their right to hold right the law, no matter what the facts are, if they, so, if they think that it was abuse of power or if they think that uh, for any reason they uh, think that uh, it's unfair that the power of jury. And of course, the trial courts today won't allow a defendant to order the jury to talk about jury no abuse of power. The jury found me not guilty of the obstructing and one disorder of conduct, but found me guilty of one disorder of conduct charge. And it, the judge sent me to the jury to jail and I'm charged. So I had to back to jail for a couple of days. And uh, <clears throat> when I got out, uh, they wanted me to sign something, and I, I'm not signing anything. So they wanted to keep me longer, but uh, they finally realized that uh, they better get me out of there. Fine. So at any rate, uh, I appealed it up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, but because I was pro se and I didn't uh, file a petition for a search yard to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, finally, on one day late, uh, I was tossed out. So my arguments went as far as the circuit in Washington County, I think that's the third circuit or what, but anyway, uh, they the public uh, court in Walsh County just paid no attention to my arguments on the appeal. Probably because I was pro se and I don't know. But anyway, the arguments of jury allocation just don't fly. And, uh, and of course, they, they just want to take it out. But at any rate, that was what made me so dedicated to fight this cause for jurors' rights to be told of their power and their sovereignty. That's important word, sovereignty. Jurors are sovereign in the fourth branch of government. We have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, which is supposed to be the two branches of government. But there's a watchdog branch of the, the jurors. They have a power, sovereign power, to override the law for any reason they so choose. And they're supposed to override the law if they think justice would be so served by doing so. And the basis of jurors, if you know anything about jurors, you know about Pennsylvania, how to name, you ever hear of William Penn? William Penn was the person in Pennsylvania after he came to this country after he left England because of persecution that was going on there. And William Penn, I forget the year it was, was arrested for holding a conventicle. William Penn and his group were Quakers. And the Church of England at that time, I believe, was Catholic. But anyway, the religion of the realm had to, everybody had to practice that religion. And the Quakers refused to practice the religion of the realm. So the king had their church doors locked up one day. So we had done and his followers were holding their services in the street. And that was called a conventicle. I don't know how they got that word, but anyway. The gendarmes came down and they threatened to arrest him if they didn't break up. And they said, well, first of all, and the conscience will not have allowed to get back to the other right to worship God and you need to choose. So they arrested William Penn and one of the other leaders of that group and threw him in jail. And the power of London, if you have any knowledge of the history of the power of London, how people didn't come out of their lives at the time, you realize how bad it was in at that time. So they, they knew how dangerous it was, but yet their principles uh, wouldn't let them uh, do what the authorities told them to do, which is very unusual. So anyway, um, they had trust, and juries, the, the recorded history of juries goes all the way back to the time of Jesus, you know, when Jesus was on the cross, they had a, a jury of crowds, and they said, which one, they said, hang on, you know, they had uh, uh, the power to let anybody, one of the two civil authorities, to hang Jesus with, but obviously who was the other guy, let go, you know, whatever. So, Way back then they had jurors, but anyway, the modern history of English jury comes uh, from the Magna Carta. Have you heard of the Magna Carta? That was in 1215, when King John, who was a very cruel judge, was cornered on the banks of the Runny Meat River in England, 
and the professor was told that sign this contract or you're dead. So he signed it, and among the demands in the Magna Carta was that the people have the right to a trial of a jury of their peers. And uh, this has come down to the ages from the Magna Carta that, uh, that was signed in 1215 by King John. But at any rate, it was between 1215 and the time of William Penn that that jury trial concept was so diluted and misapplied by the courts and policies of the be that the courts at the time and for a hundred years prior to William Penn, they were demanding that jurors find people guilty if the facts were in the suit. So the William Penn trial, of course, he was always into that so he didn't deny it. So they had, it was foolish to even have a trial. But he went to, before this jury, and the jury refused to turn a uh, verdict of guilty. And the judge says, I want you to go to to find, there's no fact in this jury, I want you to go back and deliberate until you find guilty verdict. Or you're not going home. So this went on over a weekend and they were famished and they didn't feed them and they didn't get any uh, toilet facilities and they're all men on there and they peeing in their pants and grab them in the corners and stuff like this for over the weekend. But they still were held and the owner of the jury at the time was by the name of Edward Bushell. He was a wealthy merchant, shipping merchant, and a man of principle. And he uh, and the other jurors decided that it was against their principle to find William Penn guilty. And they realized, although they weren't Quakers, that they have a right to worship in the United States. So they refused to uh, find him guilty. And uh, the judge then realized that, hey, these guys, there's no sense keeping them in further. So they had a vote. But he fined each of the 12 jurors a taxi fine, which was more than anybody could afford at this time. So the merchant was quite wealthy, and he paid a fine of all but himself and another, who because of principle, they said they cannot pay a fine because it's against their principle to uh, acquiesce that they were wrong and pay a fine. So they remained in the Tower of London. And at this time, there was a judge by the name of William, uh, that person was born with his last name. And uh, they, they had some help with uh, people who were didn't know on the law, and they got this law judge to come in and decide if these guys were being treated fairly. And he cut them loose. And it was the first time that the petition or the writ of habeas corpus was ever used. So that was devised for the William Penn trial, the writ of habeas corpus. And that was the first time it was used, I believe. And they swung these guys, uh, Edward Bushell and his other guys, from the Tower of London, never to be locked up again. Because the judge ruled that, and this is an important concept that was written into our Constitution because of that trial, that we were really good. We had to have a jury trial for two years and petition for the previous clause. Those are our Constitution for that trial. So at any rate, that's what this is all about, and the William Penn trial. But I learned about the Defending Informed Jury Association about the same time that I got myself arrested and put in jail, and uh, I joined up with that group, and I've been backing them ever since. And the goal of the Fully Informed Jury Association is to get legislation passed that will force judges to permit a criminal defendant or its attorney to talk to the jury about the concept of their power, that they're sovereign, and that they don't have to listen to the judge and do what the judge tells them. And they have been keeping this secret from jurors for many years. Uh, and there's a couple of cases that uh, they used to support this. One is the, uh, my memory doesn't serve me correctly, but the most famous one that they used throughout the country is the uh, case where there was three sailors that were involved in the shipboard, you know, merchants uh, went out to do, and they murdered somebody on their ship, 
And there was one guy that did the job and was two convicts of the party for crime. And they found the first guy guilty on the hanging. But he went next to a trial for him and a jury trial for him. And they had some lawyer and he argued that the, they should be allowed to talk about their notification that the, the sentence for this guy was too much that they shouldn't find him guilty. They couldn't override the law. They, could, they don't have to find him guilty if they don't want to. But the judge wouldn't allow that. And the the thing on this, you have to read it, really, and uh, to understand the thing. But that's what the courts all use today, that particular court case, the Supreme Court case, that they use to say that the judge is not obliged to tell the jurors of their power, these jury instructions. And if they don't know their power, that's the best. So, the judges across the land have construed that to mean that either can a defendant talk about their notification to a juror, and therefore the jurors are under the impression that if the judge tells them that they should find them guilty because there's no fact in the suit, they take that to mean that that's an order that they must find them guilty regardless of their conviction or their conscience to say that the law should be overridden or these kind of things are being punished. So that's the way it is today, and there's very few uh, uh, trials that really could uh, use this type of principle because most of the guys arrested are scoundrels and they rob somebody or do nasty things that they shouldn't be punished for. So to tell them that this comes up in a trial, but with the use of police power today, and the abuse of district attorneys on overcharging, and I forget the other president, but they are anxious to get a conviction, and they do everything they can to find the guy guilty, even to the point of withholding exculpatory evidence, inculpatory evidence, inculpatory and exculpatory. So inculpatory means that it tends to get an exculpatory would mean it uh, would tend to let them to chance of being but anyway, if they have evidence that's exculpatory, they sometimes withhold it, and that's what they do. But they do it anyway sometimes, and uh, you can find out about it later. But as we were talking with the Andrew here uh, earlier, the O.J. Simpson trial makes people think that juries really uh, are dangerous because it seems obvious to all of us that that man is guilty. And uh, I agree that the evidence presented, I thought surely the jury would find guilty. But as I see it, that jury was so accustomed to police fabricating and lying and police reports being fabricated that they had no faith whatsoever in any of the evidence that police presented. So they, whether he's guilty or not, that jury decided there's enough suspicion here that we think that uh, we're not going to find guilty. And maybe it was just the lesson to the police that you guys are a bunch of scumbags and we're not going to believe anything you say. But that's my opinion of what happened there at the detention trial. Because the evidence surely was not that I was oh, beyond a reasonable doubt because that's the standard. Of, uh, that, and you have any felony crime in the standards of the honor of the doubt, that's a hard one to overcome because any reasonable doubt that evidence presented would be consideration that the jury would have to consider. And if there's a reasonable doubt, they have to find them not guilty. And you see, a judge, on the other hand, is obliged to find a person guilty, and that overrides override the law. So that's why it's so important to have jury trials. One of our heroes was the Supreme Court Justice for the state of Washington, I mean, was uh, William Goodall. And he told us about this when he was a trial judge, that he would always tell people in a criminal trial that they should take a jury trial because the judge has no power to override the law. I mean, if he thinks that, that the police were using their power, the judge still must find the person guilty, but the jury, that's their function, to override the law for anything that the conscience tells them that uh, justice will be so served by overriding the law and finding the person that's guilty. But anyway, let's get back to 
Milwaukee in my association with this group and I stay in jail there after I got out and I uh, was active then with the Wisconsin Society of State Citizens and we were dealing in court cases quite a bit and when you're involved with the fighting the internal level service and the state action authorities, it's, it's pretty rough stuff. And uh, you might know that uh, I have leaned against my name filed at the courthouse that say I owe 100 grand or something like that. But uh, until they can produce a tax assessment that is signed and executed, executed means signed, which they can't because there's no statutory manner for doing so, I am reluctant to cooperate with them to satisfy that public threat. So it goes a lot deeper than that. But anyway, that's my stance on the taxing thing. And even though my support is there, I don't cooperate to help pay it. You know, so the only income I have, and otherwise I'm judgment proof, what they call it, because I have no problem. I own no vehicle, I own no home. And if your spouse owns property, like we had a home, they would take the property away from both of us because he's my spouse. And they could even, and they have done this, to, uh, to garnish the wife's property to the husband owes tax bill. But we got divorced in 1983, and even though we lived together, we can't touch it because we're not legally married. So anyway, it shows you how dedicated I am. So anyway, we demonstrate the courthouse on jury right day. Incidentally, uh, did I tell you that uh, it's from uh, Edward Bushell from jail in New York, in New York, in New York, and I told you that, didn't I? Yeah. So they sprung him on September 5th, way back, I don't know what the date was, 1600 or something. And that's considered by the Fully Informed Jury Association as a national holiday. And many of the states have adopted it as a state holiday, and Wisconsin has also. Did you read out that uh, document hanging outside, signed by Governor Tom Wisconsin, Wisconsin, that tells about William Penn a little bit and about Wisconsin's recognition of September 5th as your life state, your life state. So we celebrate that, and each September 5th for the they posted to it when the courts are open. Myself and others go to the courthouse in Milwaukee County and pass out our tour of both choirs, which tell a little bit about the history of juries and their power and their duty to override the law in cases where they feel justice is so served. And of course, and the prosecuting attorneys uh, said about that. And across the nation, people. Passing out in front of the courthouse have been banned, arrested, and so forth, and going to jail for trying to tell jurors about their rights. And the judges charge them with jury tampering and death of court. <clears throat> and we use this in the case we'll talk about the jurors as the basis for this, which doesn't say that the jurors don't have the right to do it, just says that the judges don't have to tell So the judges are hiding the truth from jurors. So, we, uh, cross the nation, they try to go to separate trials where a good example is, uh, remember Ruby Rich when they shot that mother and killed her with a light bulb, and, uh, they were trying to find the guy guilty of shooting the, uh, the, uh, one of the marshals there. Anyway, this organization sent a bunch of people down to where that was to petition the jurors there. And they were kept out of the courthouse because they were sort of part of the area. And that may have been instrumental in their life sentence and the uh, rejection of most of the charges. But as jurors do, they were usually compromised and finally guilty on one charge, as they did with me back in 19. Weaver, name is, I guess, was found guilty of one charge of the But anyway, he turned around to him and uh, they won. And uh, of course, so he won quite millions of dollars. But anyway, I was just talking about that to demonstrate that uh, 
the judges and the prosecuting attorneys collaborate to speak that piece from jurors. And one of the jurors on that case, uh, uh, other cases, so I'm not sure, I get mixed up on uh, some of these incidents and get mixed up. But, uh, one of the jurors in one of those trials uh, joined our organization and tried to, uh, with us, yeah, trying to expose the fact that they were the hiding the case. But getting back to our courthouse, we do this every day, and I think it was 1990 that I first started packing up these bars at the courthouse. I started with maybe uh, half a dozen people with me who went to all exits of the courthouse and around the courthouse. And in Milwaukee County, if you know the layout, you're on the steps of the south end of the courthouse. It's a little hard area before the sidewalk around it. And the deputies came out and told me I can't stand there because it's a hard area or whatever reason. I said, why can't I stand there? I said, who told you that? He said, my boss. I said, what rule is it? I don't know. You got to get out of here. We're going to arrest you. So you went out the sidewalk. You don't want to disobey an order or else or you're in trouble. So we went on the sidewalk, and then I wrote some letters to the sheriff and asking him what the story it was. And of course, he answer. So then I wrote another letter to the sheriff telling them that because you can't answer me, I believe that you don't have the power to keep us out of the courthouse, and therefore we'll need to find the courthouse from now on, passing out our fire. So we came the next year, and I get a little mixed up on one year, you know, it's been 10 years, nine or 10 years of doing this, and I get one year mixed up with the next. But uh, if memory serves me, the next year we went in and we were passing out fires inside the courthouse because they couldn't tell us the rules. And lo and behold, around 11 o'clock, some deputies came up to me and said, uh, well, at first, first we were approached by the custodian of the building and says, you have to get permission to people who pass out wires or hang uh, material on the bulletin board. They have to come to our office and get permission. I said, hey, you show me your rule. I already asked the sheriff, and they have no rule. So I said, you show me the rule, and I'll obey it. Uh, we ignored that custodian, and the sheriff's deputy left us alone that morning. But uh, because I had written letters to the sheriff telling him I would be there, but uh, at any rate, they came down at lunchtime, or just before lunchtime, I forget, but anyway, at the second time he came back in the afternoon, I think he was, and they showed me a chief judge directly. The chief judge says, hey, you can't do this no more, you can't pass out flight in the courthouse, and you've got to stay off of it, the car can swear to keep the courthouse, and you can't do it here, you can't do it here, you just have to stand the side of So we had to obey him, because you've got to just obey the court in order, and you can check the court. So I went home and I wrote a letter to the chief judge saying, with so many very polite words, hey judge, where do you get your authority? Please show me where a judge can make rules that affect the general public outside of his courtroom. Of course he can. That's because a judge's power ends at the courtroom door. So he couldn't answer me. So he didn't answer me. And by the time he had three letters written, several months had gone by, and it was time for the next year's jury rights day. So I looked. No, I didn't know. I forget what happened, but anyway, we appeared the next time and with warnings to the district attorney and so forth that we would be there and we would be inside the courthouse that we had a So we did. And uh, I think that's the year that uh, jury rights that day was celebrated on a Monday. And I had written a letter to the sheriff and the district attorney and so forth on uh, Thursday telling them we would be there on Monday. And lo and behold, Saturday, they served process on me and Bob Brown, my friend, who were activists in that uh, realm because they knew us. And they had a temporary restraining order to keep us from doing this. And they had a, an action called an injunction to keep us from passing out fire. And in the injunction, the, the district attorney asked the court to sign an order that we would not be allowed to pass out our flyers anywhere around the courthouse and between the courthouse and the jurors' parking lot, which is about four or five blocks south of the courthouse. So we couldn't be on the sidewalk between the courthouse and the parking lot if the judge would have signed the order. 
But I immediately, as soon as we got that, and when we were the first part of the emergency session on Tuesday or Wednesday, I think it was, I had served subpoenas upon the chief judge who would uh, rescind his order, and my letters to him, which showed that he had no power to do so. And I had served the district attorney and chief uh, Judge Victor Mannion. No, this gets long in detail. But anyway, Judge Victor Mannion in about 1950, 50s, I think it was, was a friend of a University of Wisconsin professor named Steve Hertzberg. Mannion was the chief judge at that time. And Hertzberg wanted to make a videotape about jurors' rights and jurors deliberating to move towards signing the verdict and using the power of the world. And then he went along with it. So, Judge, uh, the, the trial judge at the time was a, uh, who's who now the appellate uh, court judge. Oh, gosh, Henry does But anyway, they uh, allowed the defense attorney to talk about jury allocation. And you have to understand the case here. Charlie Reed was a retarded black man who had the felony conviction on his record. We don't know what the felony conviction was. But if you know the laws, Anybody that's convicted of a felony is forbidden from open owning a weapon for the last his whole life. So, Charlie Reed being a little slow and being uh, one of the people that hang around the courthouse all the time, and uh, saw that he wanted to be a private detective because the detective he had was going to be and he sent in for an ad in the How to Become a Detective from his detective magazine, and they told him he had a little gun. So he had a gun, and they were talking about this with the deputies at the courthouse one time, and they convinced Charlie that he should go home and get a gun and bring it in the show zone. So Charlie gets on the bus and goes home and gets the gun and brings it back to the courthouse, and for the whole, they send it off to the detective jury and charge him with possession of a weapon by a felon. That's what the trial was all about. Charlie Reed was convicted felon in possession of a weapon. And the, uh, the prosecuting attorney was gone home to get a conviction against Charlie Reed. And this is a case that Steve Herdberg used to film and record a jury during deliberation as part of the trial. And of course, this took the cooperation of the jury as well as the judge and the chief judge in this trial. And they were sympathetic with Steve Herdberg trying to, take, uh, trying to record the jury's rights and so forth. At this time, it wasn't an issue to me as yet. And they allowed this to happen, and lo and behold, the jurors, after much deliberation, decided that this prosecuting attorney was ridiculous. One of the main jurors was a law professor at Marquette University who was uh, tired of having his students loved and raped on campus and uh, said, hey, the district attorney, instead of going after these guys, is picking on Charlie Green? Come on. So they decided that they were going to find him. So even under the objection of some of the jurors who said the law is the law, you've got to find him guilty no matter what. But they convinced them that this was a ridiculous case and that they should find him guilty, and they did. And Charlie Reed was struck. So he's out. And once the jury finds a person not guilty, that's not the You're out, you know. That's why O.J. Simpson is free. Of course, there are some instances where they had time again with the other like uh case down south or look back or something like that where they murdered uh, some of the civil rights activists and they were demonstrating there and Beckwith was found not guilty by a jury the first time and they found new evidence and they found I uh, guess twice they found him not guilty by a jury. So the third time they finally convicted him, but the guy is so old that uh, he uh I, I don't know what happened. There, but anyway, is that a violate double jeopardy? Yes, sir, it does. I, I'm not sure that the the, uh, the ramifications of how come forth. And we're afraid that he died at the original trial. Who knew that he was a murderer or something like that? I don't. I didn't follow it closely, but that in fact happened. And the fact that this time is found guilty. But normally, in most cases, once the jury finds him not guilty, they don't have another chance to be tried. So sorry to be but getting back to the incident that applied to me. So when they tried to get an injunction against me to keep me from passing out our true or false flight, they tell the jurors they're right. 
at the courthouse. Uh, I succeeded in the commandment was the chief judge at the time of the church, and I succeeded in the chief judge at the time of the church. And the church happened when I was charged because he wrote the order uh, saying uh, I couldn't pass it out of the courthouse and through my correspondence with him, I proved what was wrong. And uh, I subpoenaed them in, and lo and behold, the prosecution on a technicality, because they didn't want the evidence to come out, asked for a dismissal, dismissal uh, without prejudice, which means that they could recharge me if they so choose. So they did dismiss it on the technicality of uh, the complaint being incomplete or improper, and they never came back and recharged me again. And I won't go into all the details, but that's the fact. So I beat D.A. Michael McCann. I didn't try and get an injunction to be from passing out by it on the sidewalk between the courthouse and the parking lot. And then I was pretty, you know, felt pretty safe passing out by it. But during this argument and trying to get Chief to rescind his order, which they still were using, the deputy sheriff were using to harass us and tell us that they arrest us for disobeying the chief's order, even though I was proved that he didn't have the power to do so. For instance, there my friend Bob Brown went down the week before September 5th uh, when we were celebrating the and he got himself arrested, not arrested, but he refused to get out of the courthouse because, hey, he says, Judge Sheedy doesn't have the power, you don't have the, the right to enforce it, so they said, well, we're going to carry out of the courthouse, so they come up, took him out, carry him out, put him on the sidewalk, and went back in. They didn't give him a ticket at that time, but lo and behold, he got a ticket in the mail for the sort of the conduct. Uh, and then uh, the next year, I 
to get yellow confused about what happened each year. But at any rate, uh, I think it was the next year that we were approached by, well, I had about six, no, four people out of that year in judges' votes. We get judges' votes and we stand in the hallway and we pass out our flyers. And uh, <laughs> one of the guys was sandals and short <laughs>
she must have complained about it to whoever she called. And about uh, maybe five to ten minutes after she called the phone, here comes three girly males. So one female the male down the hallway towards us. Bob gives snaps the picture as we're approaching. And lo and behold, the leader, who must have been a senior man or something, passes me by with my judges down there, with a sign in front, passing my way. And he goes right to my friend Bob Brown. Grabs him by the arm of the camera. This says, "You can't take pictures in the courthouse." And he uses the camera to do it. And Bob says, "What do you mean? Why can't I take pictures?" He says, "You can't take pictures." And Bob arguing with him. Why? What law? What rules? And the judge says, "Listen, you have to go out, get out of the courthouse right away, or you're going to be under arrest." And Bob says, "What law am I breaking?" And he was in no mood to take any back talk. Challenge for the arrest of Bob Brown. He passed me by and ignored me, passing out flyers in the hallway, and hauled him off to the, uh, to the holding tank where they put him in handcuffs and tightly and chained chain to a bench there for over an hour. But I'm standing here in the hallway and I uh, never got bothered. So it was amazing to me that they ignored me by the rest of the end. So anyway, I was standing there and he came back in about an hour and they, he told me that um, he complained to a nurse that happened to pass him by that he was having heart palpitations. So he, he, she convinced the deputy that she got out of the wall and he had a heart attack and uh, died in, in the jail there, which has happened several times and they got in trouble for death that occurred in the jail. Anyway, they took the roots and gave him tickets for disorderly conduct and this deputy never spoke about as why he was disorderly, what he did that was wrong. So again, we challenged it and we got the district attorney to dismiss it for failure to claim. And now we're getting ready to sue him and we asked for open records and we filed a notice of claim which you have to do within 120 days of the incident asking for damages and we filed that and they have to respond within uh, 90 days and if they don't respond within 90 days then you can start an action to collect for being for being damaged so we're waiting on that that's so satisfying what you did with that? Bob Brown? Bob Brown, yeah oh, what year was it? this year oh, December 5th of 1991 I mean, 1990 that's not a year yet, 1991 that was 1990, yes so, uh, we're waiting on that. But, uh, let me see. It's all down in my story here. But we're getting ready to sue them. But, uh, don't want it, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Because they'll be sanctioned by the judge and they'll take the license away. 
have a national license, but there are associations, bar associations, that the lawyers, lawyers do not have licenses. There is no license to the lawyer. The association with the bar association is tantamount to a license. The bar association is different. So you're better off doing it yourself than the bar. But of course, there's still prejudice in prosecuting the attorneys don't want defendants to go in pro se defending themselves. So you've got to think. Crusade against you if you're without an attorney and don't stand a chance with an attorney anyway because he's uh, part of the problem. Collaboration there. So it's real hard road to tow when you're challenging your station on some of these things and trying to bring up the abuse of power that's occurring across our land. And uh, me being spending time 30 years in jail was very much of a wake up call for me and why I'm so involved in this effort. And, oh yes, I didn't tell you why I changed my name, did I? Well, for the one year that uh, I used the method of uh, protecting myself from being harassed by deputies at the courthouse, I decided to run for court of court on the platform of exposing corrupt churches. So I ran as an independent and got enough petition signatures to run as the court of court. And uh, I decided that I was going to run on the ticket of exposing corrupt judges with a name like Whistleblower. We would have put two or two together and people would have looked at it to see that the whistleblower was going to expose corrupt judges and maybe get one. So that was on the ballot. My name, my new name, I'm no longer Willie Curry, Willie Meg, I'm now Whistleblower. <laughs> and, uh, I use that for about four years now. And I'm no longer here. I'm sure you're officially on the whistle. And uh, we, at that time, I'm also associated and uh, affiliated with the Right to Life people to demonstrate the signs about the Board of Jesus all over the missions and so forth. And those people helped me to run for office. And we got 12 of those people to help me. And I didn't wear a judge's crown that day. I was in my suit while they, in judge's robes, paraded outside around the courthouse. And they distributed my campaign literature, which said about the same thing, only that vote for courier, vote for whistleblower, because he's going to support for a second about the broad, so know about my history and so forth. And they filed a line of 12 people, including four women, a couple of youngsters underage. And they praised the courthouse through the cafeteria and around the courthouse and in the hallways, you know, in a single fire line, the walking slowly for most of the day throughout the courthouse and we were left alone. Because the strongest protection you can have in the democratic process is your right to uh, claim abuse of power and try to get into office to on the campaign of exposure to that corruption. So that's what they were doing. And they left us alone and I'm still registered as a candidate. And they run for potentially running for court by each time when the thing opens up at certain days you have to go out and get enough petitions to be on the ballot. Once you get the petition to run again, but uh the last time I couldn't put the time for that if you had mentioned the clearing the court out. So that's the story there, that's why I was so successful in using the technique of smearing the judges more or less by calling them corrupt, by claiming truthfully that they hide the truth. Now the whole function of jury to justice system is to find the truth. So when judges purposely hide the truth from jurors about the system itself, I think that's good. I, that's why I think it's rough and there's no way I don't think they can argue against me so that's a legitimate claim that the judges are conspiring but not all judges did I tell you about the judge in Washington State in the middle he's dead now he uh, was the Supreme Court Justice of the Supreme Court of State of Washington when he was with his name and he was amongst our group of William Bunker Association as our had a lot of judges across the land. And Lynn Goodlow came to one of our national 
seminar is put together and spoke, and we've got him on recording on video tape and audio tape, talking about his experience with trying to tell jurors and tell defendants that they should use jury trial rather than let the judge decide because the judge is here. Uh, obliged to find guilty if there's no fact in dispute, dispute, whereas that's the juror's function to override the law if they think justice would be better served by returning a not guilty verdict. So that's what he talked about at the seminar, and he sort of drove with a fellow, and uh, he died a couple of years later, but he wrote quite a few uh, articles on that, and it's available, as you can see, in the newspaper or the yellow sheet there, but we have offers for, uh, through the Forty One Third Association from the Supply in Helmsville, Montana, which is a very small town. <laughs> Anyway, so that's my uh, personal story. I think that's here in Milwaukee County, at least, but nobody else has taken up the cause, and I don't really actively try to recruit people. And the thing is, people fighting in all aspects of it, uh, government power in many aspects, with the tax system and money system and many other aspects of power abuse. So, uh, you expect yourself to do it when you take up too many causes. So I try to concentrate on your rights. And of course, the tax argument is main, mainly on my list of very important things because they could put me in jail for willful failure to apply. And that's why I must work on my evidence to bring before a jury if they so charge me. And I feel very comfortable and keep in touch with you. Take your community on that. Uh, realm throughout the, uh, on the internet and through various organizations throughout the nation um, and the fight against the legal tech. But, uh, let me see. Oh, yes. Uh, Dr. Lehman is a historian for our group. He's a man who lives in California. He must be about 90 years old now. He's written several articles at various rights. And he was the one who went to England and uncovered the court records of the William Penn trial and wrote a book on it called The Ordeal of Edward Michel. And this is where that all goes back in this book about how uh, the jury was instrumental in bringing William Penn from being hung. So, I should say also that uh, there were other jurors that couldn't withstand the pressure of the judges, and many people were hung in England because the jury, it was winter time, they'd be freezing in the chambers from the judge's home, and they must find guilty of it. So they found, found the guy guilty, and they knew they were hanging, even though know, the video was pretty good. So, I mean, it was bad. So, that's what the people were escaping from in England. That's why they came to this country. That's why we have Jimmy Penn and Men of Israel and Jefferson and all those people. That's what the country is. But uh, the other book that Dr. Lehman wrote is called We the Jurors. And that's a fascinating book. And I think both of those books are available at any public library. And I encourage you to get especially We the Jury. That was published in 1997. And most public libraries have it. And it's a compendium uh, of about eight or nine different areas of the world and the history whereby the juries were instrumental in seeking justice, one of which was Susan B. Anthony's ordeal when she occurs, uh, accomplished women's suffrage. And I never even had too much respect for Susan Anthony until I read that book, and I have a lot of respect for her, and a lot of uh, ill will against judges because you read what the judge did to her in that trial, finding her guilty of breaking the law by voting. You'll see why I'm bitter against the, the justice system and judges being so corrupt. In other words, you should recognize and become familiar with the word sophistry. That's legal mumbo jumbo when they write their decisions so that you can't tell heads and tails about what they're talking about. And they do that all the time with income tax laws and so forth. But 
uh, in the instance that I was talking about with the jury, so the jurors that were hung, the decision there sounded like a bunch of soft history too, but if you read it, the accounts of the history of what went on there, some of the people that researched it, you'll see what a sound of that man was, and uh, he was told the jurors that they had a plan to and they didn't at all have He was 
Bob's room and took charges. Made the jury realize that he was over, over, that's the word I'm looking for, overreach. Bob's room and trying frequently are engaged in what is known as overreach. And they're about to keep cases like this. They don't have to. They don't have the power to uh, bring a lesser charge or even not prosecute it for such a chance. So what? And look at what's happening with Clinton in that crowd. I mean, there's never any prosecution. And that's the prerogative uh, of uh, the Attorney General in federal cases and local cases to it to bring a charge if they so choose and talk about it. So they all write it when it's their buddies uh, and they overreach when it's somebody that they want to get for whatever reason. That's the state of our law enforcement. And to save that movement, we call it uh, the law enforcement industry. And it's a collaboration between the judicial branch and the administrative branch. And of course, there are some judges, but very few and far between, that uh, will allow jurors or the criminal defendants to talk about you're going to have to take, you know, take the concept to this jury. And then again, of course, it's few and far between where a criminal trial comes up where there's no fact in dispute and the guy did what they said he did, but he still wants the jury to find him not guilty. Like the charge of Can I talk about the charge of Okay. Uh, charge of Reed was the entire black man. Oh, I thought it was. So uh, that was the case of overreach by the prosecuting attorney. And he did to realize that this guy couldn't reach the guy's face. Yeah, he didn't intend to break the law. But uh, that's overreach. And he should have said, hey, Charlie, you left against the law. Come on back and get rid of it. We're going to confiscate your gun, but we're not going to try to do that. It seems to me if I was this attorney, that's what I, that's what I would do. But me, my public hand was uh, this attorney at the time, I do believe. Maybe he wasn't, I'm not sure. That was a long time ago, but nonetheless, uh, the uh, various assistant district attorneys have almost free reign to do whatever they damn please. Uh, and he doesn't, the elected district attorney doesn't rein those people in. Sometimes they have a lot of overreach that is going on in charges. Of course, in Washoe County with the case, that is the elected district attorney that was handling that because it's a high profile case. So it's his fault for the overreach that we are giving But, any other questions uh, that you have about yours? Yeah, I got a couple, actually. Um, I'm not sure if you're not telling Oh, well, I won't go in that, but get to that too much because it's not related really to very but I have determined that the, it's a fraudulent scheme, and because of the complicated nature of the income tax laws, I have to fix even the judges start to dispute over whether it's taxable income or not. In fact, we've been researching it for years, and there's all kinds of disputes over whether it's valid or not, and the voluntary nature and all that stuff. So I have decided that uh, if they want to assess the tax against me, they can go ahead and assess me, but I want to see a signed assessment. And they don't have the statutory power to create a valid assessment that's executed or signed by somebody that says, you owe so much tax. So when they file liens at the courthouse, they say that uh, they claim it's an assessment, but they don't show it to you. So they have, I have liens against me at the courthouse, federal tax liens, they're probably total 100 grand now. But I hesitate to cooperate to satisfy those liens until they produce a executed signed assessment showing me that I, they have a valid claim on the valid tax against and the, the structure of the so-called 5.6 and the IR code is so muddled up that they can't uh, prove it. They can't, they can't produce an execute assessment. So that's my position. And if they charge me criminally with willful failure to file, I hope I can be allowed to tell my jury that. But the way it goes today, the prosecuting attorneys have ways of 
great emotions and liberty we call it, so it prevents the defendant from thinking about evidence that he wants to present. And I don't know, it's such a corrupt system that I know it's already getting that I stand the chance to be put in jail for the position I take, and I accept the that, so uh, that's the way it is, but, you know, I've read other trials of friends, especially my friend Dennis Kahn, who was the leader of the Wisconsin Society of Experts with me. He went to a federal trial on most of the trials he had in the Alvin Terrorism Court. And uh, he got found guilty and he sent some time in jail. He's out again. He's an insurance agent that has a quite substantial business. And he had to pay real heavy on that. But uh, he had a lot of property. It was not judgment proof. But, of course, before I even started this, I made sure that I was judgment proof, which means that I don't own a car, I don't own any property that can be seized, other than my retirement income. And of course my stance on social security is that it's part of the and I have not applied to social security in North Korea for all of my life. And I don't want to get into that too deeply, but uh, the income tax and the social security is tied together like that. And, it's a employment tax of what Social Security is, and if you want to take advantage of the Social Security, you have to file a forty form because you're part of that socialist scheme. And everybody today in this whole country, except the patriots who have bailed out of the Social Security system, are practicing socialists. You mean Social Security system? They're practicing socialists, literally. So I don't want to go into that, but at any rate, uh, you don't get your jury to listen to those arguments, of course. And why you don't take that? Because most of the women, you just keep talking about all those things. And the fact is, so the jury says, hey, I gotta pay taxes, why don't we have to pay taxes? Well, why do you have to pay taxes? As they did with my friend Rose Alex, did I tell you about her? No, I think it's. She, uh, she's been part of our Social Security Association. I, I don't know if her marital status, but uh, at any rate, she lives in Washington County, and this was way back before I, I was still a before I retired in court, and she uh, was charged with local failure to file. And we attended her trial in Washington County and listened to her nephew, I think it was, who was an attorney, defend her and listened to the judge for business him or her from bringing up the concept of their allocation that they have a right to override the law if they, for any reason, and if they think that she is correct in her true, true belief that she didn't have to pay tax, they have the right to override the law. But they believe that uh, there was a law that she had to pay taxes, so they found the guilty. So she sent them time in jail. And that's one of the uh, star cases that they use in Wisconsin to say that uh, jurors don't have the right to be told of their duty and their sovereignty and their rights. Uh, I hate using the word rights because their power can override the law for any reason they choose, especially if they think that justice would be served by so doing, like in many of these cases of abuse of power by the police. But again, when these things go to trial, the defendant seldom gets to talk about his reason for being elected. So, and especially if it's a municipal charge, you don't get to do that. So that's one of the cases that is uh, precedent in Wisconsin for the tax system is the elected case. Rose elect us from Washington County. And the other one they use is, uh, I still can't remember her name. It has two names in it. But she was a waitress in Madison and in a restaurant when two uh, undercover spin operation detectives were looking for purchasing marijuana and they looked like one bag and they were there asking about putting marijuana and they asked her who sells marijuana she said I don't know but maybe those guys who were there might know because I think they're in the drug so they went over there and asked them about it and they sold them drugs so they arrested those two guys for possession with intent to deliver which is a serious felony and they turned up and charged her also with being part of the crime for leading them to the cover. And an attorney by the name of William Hangman was the defense attorney on that, and he wanted to bring up jury notification charges for her so that the jury would see that kind of ridiculous that she was charged in that circumstance. But 
that wasn't allowed, and the jury was kept from the defense team talking about their location, and of course, they were found guilty, and spent time in jail, and had a felony charge against it. And there's still more by the court Washington, that's also a felony. Now, he cannot possess a weapon for the rest of his life, and he can't vote for the rest of his life because of the charge. No, I, I'm not sure how that works, to tell you the truth. I think only, uh, maybe they do in this case because I think they only apply to child molesters. But I'm not sure about that. Maybe, but I think he's married to the Almao. She's had babies for a long time. You weren't sure if she was going to have a fortune or not. You were worried about that. But I think she did have a baby. She went out to some other state. But, uh, I'm not sure of the, the circumstances without the effect of that was. But I think they're married. But anyway, this is... The sad thing about that is when, when we take it at the sentencing hearing there, he contacted the jurors and he contacted the mother of Mr. Gilmore, you know, and tried to convince them of that the judge was wrong, the prosecuting attorney was wrong, that they shouldn't have told the jury that they could find the judge. You know, it's all the way they say it. The judge says, the attorney says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the evidence. And if the evidence shows that in fact, did what he's charged with, he should find him guilty. That should. So you, it doesn't mean must, but it means should in such a way that it makes the jury believe that they must find him guilty if there's no facts in the suit. And there's no facts in the suit. He's got a pregnant and she was guilty. So that's what the law says. So they found him guilty. And they were crying about it because they had to find him guilty. So that was an excellent case to bring out how corrupt the system is. And we tried to bring it out, but the jurors refused to talk to us on that, and I respect very much the jurors' right to be left alone. And I went out of them, and I sent them all a letter that I could find their addresses, but they never responded to my letters trying to tell them that uh, the system is corrupt. So, should it be corruption or the lack of education? Well, there's lack of education. And, you know, even the judges uh, don't realize that they're doing this wrong power in any instance. It's just the way the policy is today, and they think it's right for them. I don't know. They don't bother to realize that. They don't teach them that in law school. You go to law school, they don't teach these things about the way they can trial and the jurors' power and the concept of the jury to override the law. And the whole concept of jury. You know, when I started my job as a policeman in 1961, I went into the job thinking that, well, the guy had six proceedings, and he went in front of the jury and told the jury that, hey, my wife was pregnant, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, there was no traffic, and I was only going 10, 15 miles to 2, 10, 15 miles over the road, and there was no danger there. Please find me not guilty, even though I was speeding. But in the municipal and all traffic cases, you don't get to do that. The jury doesn't get that. They're told that they must find him guilty in traffic cases. There's no fact in the future. So if you're going to admit to a police officer that you're going one or two miles over the limit, they will find you guilty. And a police officer. So if you're charged with 15 miles over, instead of going to the police officer with your down and say, well, we'll find you. Or it's then on your attorney and your points and all that, but they have 